This is powered by biofuel, by Wheaties, and it uses one kilowatt hour per 100 person kilometers. Uh, that's 80 times as good as the fossil fuel vehicle we started from. But the lady in the tank on the left will say, no, 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 that's a lifestyle change. I can't possibly ride a bicycle. I demand a steel box to zoom in. So how about zooming in this? Here's a piece of public transport uh, using six kilowatt hours per 100 person kilometers. Uh, that's more than 10 times as good as the fossil fuel vehicle. But the lady in the tank on the left will say, nope, that's a lifestyle change too. I can't possibly travel with all those horrible people. So you have to have your own personal box to move in. Well, how about zooming in this? Uh, this eco car comfortably accommodates one teenager. It uh, is almost as good as the bicycle in terms of its energy consumption. And it, uh, it's shorter than a traffic cone. And <laughs> It get, delivers this performance as long as you don't go faster than 15 miles per hour. So this is the possibility for, for innovation using a fossil fuel vehicle that's smaller. And the lady in the tank might say, no, that's no good either. So can we give us something that's more familiar, uh, a, a, a vehicle that looks like a car but uses less energy? Well. You can't do much about the air resistance. If you zoom along, you create swirling air behind your car, except you can make it more fish-shaped like this one on the right. But the biggest saving, perhaps, comes from electrification. Petrol and diesel engines are 25% efficient at turning chemical energy into oomph. In an electric vehicle, you have a battery that contains chemical energy. And through the miracle of uh, chemistry, you end up with oomph at the wheels with an efficiency of about 85 or 90%. So electrical vehicles are far more energy efficient. Here's one in London whose energy consumption is 21 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. That's measured at the socket. And you might object and say, well, oh, where did that electricity come from? If the electricity came from fossil fuels at a power station that's only 30% efficient, then of course we haven't gained very much by this innovation. But we don't have to get our electricity from burning fossil fuels. There are other ways to get electricity. Wind farms, underwater wind farms, nuclear power. So there are other options that we can be looking at. And electric vehicles aren't new. Here's Edison with an electric vehicle, and here's a, a French uh, world speed record holder in 1899 in an electric vehicle. And there's lots of them being developed now, and they all have performance similar to the one that um, a friend of mine measured at the socket with that London car. Here's some muscle cars that look quite promising. And here's some with crazy doors, which do even better uh, with consumptions of just six kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. Electric scooters are even better, uh, coming in at three kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. And as a transitional technology, plug-in hybrids offer us a way to carry on using a little bit of fossil fuels and wean ourselves onto electric vehicles without feeling too uncomfortable. A plug-in hybrid would have a little petrol or diesel engine on, on board uh, that can recharge the battery if you start running out of, of juice and thus give you a range similar to a standard fossil fuel vehicle while actually most of the time behaving like a standard electric vehicle. I don't understand why, but there seems to be an obligation that all plug-in hybrids have to look like killer robots from the future. <laughs> and what's their performance? They use about 25 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. So not quite as good as the electric vehicles we just saw uh, because of the extra weight, presumably, but uh, promising nonetheless. OK, so electrification is a technology that allows us to make transport much more efficient. What about heating? Why do we need 40 kilowatt hours per day of heating in cartoon Britain? Well, it's mainly because we have crappy buildings. And here's a crappy building in Cambridge. It's my house with the Ferrari out front. And it loses heat because it's leaky. And there's a temperature difference between the inside and the outside for much of the year. And the heat loss is the product of those two terms. And the power required to make up for the heat loss is the heat loss divided by the efficiency with which you can create heat from your power source. Uh, that's called the coefficient of performance of heat creation. And for setting fire to natural gas, which is a standard method of making heat in Britain, the efficiency is about 90%. And that might sound quite good, 90% from chemical energy to heat. But in a moment, I'll show you that this is not very good and we can do much better. How do we reduce the power required? We attack the three colored terms on the right hand side. We can reduce the temperature difference with this amazing piece of technology called the thermostat, which I mentioned earlier. You can turn your thermostat down five degrees. It will halve your heating consumption. I've tried it. It works. And some people call it a lifestyle change. Second, we can reduce the leakiness. This can be done by putting fluff in the walls, fluff in the roof, and perhaps getting a new front door with better insulation properties. All of these measures might give you a 25% improvement 
What's really needed to significantly reduce the leakiness is either the Swedish uh, method of bulldozing the British house and building one to, to good quality Scandinavian standards, or we could go for the German retrofit technique where you actually put 12 or 20 centimeters of rock wool on the outside of the walls to really improve the insulation properties of the building. What else can we do? Well, we could make the heat delivery system more efficient. 90% sounded pretty good, but the important news is that there are ways of delivering heat into buildings that are far more efficient than 90%. 90% efficiency at turning high-grade chemical energy into low-grade heat is actually not at all good. Heat pumps, which are back-to-front refrigerators, are a way of delivering possibly as much as 4.9 units of heat for every one unit of chemical energy, or, uh, sorry, of electrical energy, high-grade energy, that the, the heat pump so here in Japan, they've recognized the importance of heat pumps uh, for several decades, and they've had an efficiency drive that says all heat pumps must be better than average. And the results are here. You see Pumpu and Tankman both with cape and gloves, and, they're, and they're, they've got cute eyes, the lot. They're amazing. So Pumpu is an air source heat pump. He pumps heat like a back-to-front refrigerator, moves heat from the garden into the kitchen. And uh, you you give him one unit of electricity, he ends up delivering 4.9 units of heat into the kitchen and into Tank Man, who's a hot water container. So, are heat pumps really this good? Um, uh, perhaps a coefficient of performance of 300% is, is realistic for, for heat pumps. If anyone here knows more about them and has good data for their performance in North America, I'd be very interested. There are various flavors of heat pumps that can pump heat from the air, like Pumpu does, or you can pump heat out of the ground using ground source heat pumps. And so if a building is currently not being heated with a heat pump, perhaps we can make things far more efficient by switching to heat pumps. A final thing to say about uh, possible efficiency measures is there's this astonishing technology called read your meters. And this has had the biggest effect on my life of all the technologies I've tried. I was writing a book on sustainable energy, and a friend asked me, how much energy do you actually use at home? And I was embarrassed to say that I didn't actually know. I had the meter readings, but hadn't been looking at them. So I started reading my meter every week. And I used to use 40 or 50 kilowatt hours per day of natural gas to warm the house. And after reading the meter every week, I ended up using 13 kilowatt hours per day. So this is about a 60% saving in energy consumption for heating. Excuse me. And similarly, I was reading my electricity meter every week, and doing that reduced my electricity consumption from 4 kilowatt hours per day down to 2 kilowatt hours per day. So what's going on? Well, by reading the meters, you're, you start playing a video game, you become a scientist, you do experiments, you wonder, can I beat last week's high score? And you try things out. You, I attended a talk where someone said the average temperature in British buildings it used to be not 20 centigrade in the winter, but 13 centigrade, 7 degrees centigrade lower. And so I thought, well, let's try it. Um, and <laughs> the fact is, if you've just cycled in on a freezing cold night, you come into a building at 13 centigrade, it feels perfectly warm, at least for the first hour or two. <laughs> and if you're only in there for an hour or two, then there was no need to warm the building at all for the, the whole day uh, before you, you got home. And so I think thermostats are wrong. We shouldn't have thermostats where you set a temperature. Uh, one thing that's wrong with this thermostat is it doesn't have any way of switching it off. It's, this is my hotel room in Boston, and it right now is carefully pinning the temperature to whatever the thermostat is set at. There's no way I can tell it. I'm not actually there. So we've got to get away from thermostats and get people tinkering uh, with uh, with their environment. Here's the experiments I did on uh, electricity consumption. For a few days, I lived normally, and then I tried doing the experiment of switching off all the vampires, not just the phone charger, which we know is not very important, but the DVD player, the stereo, the modem, and all these things that I wasn't using most of the time. I tried switching them all off, and I found that my background uh, consumption went down from 70 watts to 25 watts, which is a, a saving of one kilowatt hour per day, one light bulb's worth, so worth doing. It's about 1% of uh, an average person's footprint. And uh, this saving of 45 pounds a year, of course, I can spend on an extra holiday in Lanzarote. Which brings us to Jevons' paradox, which is to remind you that we can make technology more efficient and feel very good about that, but perhaps the outcome of uh, these efficiency measures is you actually end up using more energy. So that's something to worry about, and I don't have a solution. Okay, 
I've talked through the technology and efficiency options. Now what about the supply side? Well, I've, I've mentioned uh, three options there. Maybe I need to, to move on. Um, let's talk about how to make a plan uh, that adds up. There's one more detail that we'd better talk about. It's not enough to have average demand match average supply. We need them to match all the time. And perhaps that requires demand uh, management and some storage mechanisms. So I'd like to say a little bit about storage. Um, in Britain, electricity demand currently fluctuates every day. These are daily fluctuations. And gas demand for heating varies uh, annually. This is one year's variation with great big spikes when the temperature is low. These are temperature graphs up here, and this is gas consumption um, going up into the 70, uh, 76s of kilowatt hours per day per person um, nationally uh, compared with a summer consumption of 32 kilowatt hours per day per person. So we have fluctuations, and we need to, to cope with them in some way. And it, on the electricity side, storage systems are an option, pump storage systems like this one in North Wales. And heat storage, I think, is going to be a, a very important technology for this 2050 future that we're trying to visualize. If we can move heat, if we can have heat do time travel from summer to winter, that could really help out with the midweek, the, the midwinter peak demand. And in Canada, there's a solar community where 50 homes are using extremely outsized solar hot water panels on their garages here uh, to generate far too much hot water in the summer. And they pump the heat down into the ground um, and then pump it back out in the winter. So here's the hole in the ground, um, lots of holes 35 meters uh, deep um, in a place with a radius of 35 meters or so which has very much the same scale as the, uh, the ice houses that used to be um, common around this part of the world. Um, and it's got a similar function. This was for time travel of, of cold from winter to summer, of course. And there indeed used to be an international energy trade transferring cold on ships uh, around the world. Norway used to export ice uh, to London um, to the tune of 340,000 tons of ice per year. OK, how do we make a plan that adds up? I'm suggesting largely electrifying transport, largely electrifying building heating using heat pumps, and insulating all buildings as well as possible and engaging people with reading their meters are the, some key actions to take on the demand side. Then we will probably have a roughly tripled increase in electricity demand um, because we've electrified transport and heating. Um, on top of what we're already doing. This is assuming no radical lifestyle change. So how do we satisfy the tripled electricity requirement? Well, the mix will have to involve our renewables, nuclear power, which might just be some sort of stopgap, clean coal, again, unproven at scale, possibly just a stopgap, and finally, other people's renewables. So. How can we put these options together? Let's assume that we do have a tripling of electricity supply. This map visualizes for the UK what you could build in order, in order to match a, a tripled um, electricity demand. And it's got a diversity of options. I'm not recommending this particular mix. I'm choosing a diversity because it allows you to visualize very easily the exchange rates and the alternatives that, that um, we might want to choose after looking at this map. First on the list, let's have solar power from other people's deserts. We're getting 16 light bulbs per person from Libya or Algeria. I visualized to scale on this map the, the size of those facilities. They're roughly twice the size of London in the Sahara that you would need. And in addition, uh, there would have to be power lines all the way across Spain and France delivering the power from the Sahara to Surrey. The next thing on the list uh, by uh, size is nuclear power. Here I have 16 kilowatt hours per day per person of, of nuclear. This would correspond to a fourfold increase in nuclear over today's levels in Britain. Uh, which could be accommodated at most of the sites where we have nuclear power, as long as we had a, a four power stations per location. Next, on the renewable side, the biggest renewable I'm showing here is wind power. Each of these gray squares shows to scale 100 square kilometers of wind farm, uh, some of them in the sea, some of them in England, and some of them up here in Scotland. In fact, lots in Scotland, because Scotland currently is anti-nuclear, and that's no problem. You just get more wind farms. 
And this visualization shows the exchange rate. If you say, no, 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 I don't want solar power from someone else's desert, no problem. We cross off the yellow block and we say, oh, we just need twice as much nuclear power as we had a moment ago. So we need an eight-fold increase in nuclear power over today's levels. And we still have a, a plan of the same type. Or you could say, no, I don't like nuclear power. So we cross off the nuclear and we could say, let's have more wind. Uh, so you just need three times as much wind as is shown on, on this map here. So this is a, an illustration of the scale of action that 